So, thank you, Charles, for the introduction. Um, when I first talked to Joe and Charles about speaking here at Release Notes, naturally my first question was, what's the conference policy regarding stage pyrotechnics? Um, there was some back and forth, you know, I use words like spectacular and awe-inspiring. Um, they use words like liability and insurance. I had to scale back my original vision a bit, but we'll move forward anyway. Um, in the fall of 2006, 10 years ago, I quit my job and formed an indie software company called Agile Tortoise. If I say I went indie when I quit my job, it's probably not really the whole story. I had been doing indie things for a long time prior to that. I published a arts and music magazine with a friend in the early 90s. I brought that to the web in the late 90s. I put out shareware games, mostly as side projects. Um, when I decided to go indie, it was about making a lifestyle choice and trying to merge those things that I enjoyed doing with how I made a living. Now, what is an indie software company? That's kind of vague. Um, in some industries, there's a specific definition. Like in film, there's an established studio system, and if you work outside that system, you're an indie. Uh, but that's not really true in software. It's kind of a self-identification thing. But it has a certain air to it and meaning. You know, being an indie has unique advantages. Indies tend to be a spark of innovation in their industry, um, in film and music and software. Indies tend to be nimble and small and have the opportunity to explore, um, be creative, and learn new things, experiment with ideas, not just in their products, but how they go about executing them in a business context. Certainly, they can try new things, which is fun. And yes, in addition to being an indie, I'm an indie in the Apple ecosystem, kind of why we're all here. At least right now I am. I wasn't when I started. There was no App Store 10 years ago when I started this adventure, but it was an opportunity I seized. Apple has built spaces for indies to flourish. They provided tools, platforms, and the compelling hardware that has drawn a lot of us into this ecosystem. Apple's had an awkward history with indies. I mean, they do things like Sherlock them or uh, apply a tractor beam and suck them into the mothership, or I mean, hire them. Uh, <laughs> But it's clear that there are people high up at Apple who see the value of having a healthy indie presence on their platforms, even if they don't always listen to our concerns about the App Store. Um, so pursuing this indie adventure for me has really been more about finding balance, a balance between things I enjoy and challenge me, and the things that keep the lights on, as my dad would say. Um, I did actually, I went to business school. I wasn't a comp sci major or anything. And they taught me in business school that the goal of business is to maximize shareholder value. Um, and I think that's still completely true as an indie. It's just that you and maybe just a few of your partners are, are, are the only shareholders. So you can choose to define that value differently and what it means to you. It's not just about revenue. I may sound like a bit of a hippie, but that's how I define value, is finding the right balance for what keeps me happy in what I'm doing. The great thinkers in the martial arts, uh, stress balance. Balance puts you into a position to both defend and attack. Attack new opportunities that present themselves, and defend your business against upheaval and market forces. Uh, to maintain balance, it implies finding an equilibrium between opposing forces. And I'm going to structure the rest of my talk around a few of these opposing forces that I've struggled with in different ways over the last 10 years. Some of them more general or business-like, some more personal. 
So let's get started. Tell me that wouldn't have been fun. <laughs> so the first of these is predictability at risk. Now Christina talked about her own struggle with this some last night. Um, and I think it's interesting because there's a myth that running your own business, being indie, is a inherently more risky than having a real job. And I kind of think the opposite is true, um, but it does make risk something that you have to actively manage. Real jobs have plenty of risk too. If you've ever been on the wrong end of a layoff or something, you're well aware of that. But they offer a certain level of predictability, predictable income through a paycheck, and they tend to abstract that risk where someone else is worrying about it, not you. But where are you going to reside on the risk predictability spectrum comes down a lot to your own personal risk aversion and tolerance. But if you've gone into business for yourself as an indie or otherwise, you've already sort of accepted the proposition that it's worth tolerating periods of risk and instability to possibly reach a more stable place. My approach to balancing predictability and risk is to try to break risk up into small chunks. Don't deal with it all at once. And that starts with planning and deciding what kind of business you're going to run. Um, are you going to be focused or diversified? If you're going to pin your hopes on a single monolithic project, um, you bring with it the chance of great rewards, but a lot of risk all in one compartment. If you break yourself out over a series of ventures, each with smaller amounts of risk, any one succeeding or failing maybe is not going to jeopardize your business. Are you doing products or client work? I'm sure there's a lot of people in the room who do both. Each has their advantages. Um, client work is more predictable. It's like a paycheck, but the the promise of greater rewards of developing products um, is compelling as well. What I try to do is consider my business a series of mini business plans. I don't have one big overarching business plan for Agile Tortoise as a company, but I tend to take each venture and use the same tools to evaluate it. If I'm going to do a new product, a major upgrade to a product, or take a contract for some client work. I don't put together a 10-page packet of spreadsheets and charts, but I do the same basic process. I sit down, what are the costs? What are the likely rewards? What are the time frames involved? Is it a, a good venture for me to partake at this time? And I try to generate predictability through multiple income streams, divide myself up. Um, if you're doing this, you should be able to set targets for your income distribution. You maybe not always hit them, but you should be able to say, hey, next year I hope to make 40% of my money from my products and 60% from client work or whatever. Because if you have those kind of distributions in mind, they work as a lens that you can help evaluate your mini business plans for what's the right fit for you at the time. You can employ multiple business models, especially if you're doing a number of products. Don't sell them all the same way. Look for opportunities to be in the different types of, you know, freemium advertising-based paid apps, because each has their advantages. Look for revenue opportunities outside the app store, especially these days. Um, Partnerships and sponsorships may be a great idea for you. Um, you may have a product idea that doesn't make a lot of sense to develop and try to sell directly, but is very complementary to some other business who might be interested in helping you develop it on a white label type of deal, things like that. Take advantage of free money whenever you can, things like affiliate program. Um, if you're not using the iTunes affiliate program, no, it's not going to bring in enough revenue to pay the bills, but you're leave, leaving 7% of your revenue on the table for any link that comes through your website if you're not employing that, and that's silly. 
Look for peripheral opportunities, maybe generating content, things like that. Some people do co podcasts. Some people do conferences, <laughs> books. Some of these things aren't revenue generators. Some of them just may generate rep reputation, but depending on how, they, how you do them, they can generate revenue as well. If you've divided yourself up like this, you've mitigated your exposure to risk from external factors, um, but you can still plan for them and work to avoid them whenever possible. And things like app rejections are real. I mean, if you have a wonderful app idea that skirts the borders of the App Store review guidelines, don't invest six months in it before you submit and find out whether Apple's going to be okay with it. Be prepared for something like an ad network shutdown. If you have a portfolio of ad-based uh, products, divide them up across networks. Ad networks do shut down sometimes, like I add. Is that going to shake up your business for several months while you retool? Um, shouldn't have to. Be aware of how a new competitor would impact your business. Again, if you rely on a single major product and say a venture-backed startup enters the same space with a competitive product that they give away for free, how's that going to impact your business? And when you're figuring out your risk profile, clearly there are personal factors that affect that too. Um, You've got to have enough predictability in your system to absorb life events. They happen, good ones and bad ones. Um, and something as simple as partner income can really affect, especially if you're starting out, how much risk you're willing to take on. If you have a spouse, even if it's just that through their job you have access to affordable medical insurance, it can be a big deal on how much risk you're willing to take on in the short term. What's that look like for me? I pulled my numbers for the 10 years I've been doing this um, and made a revenue distribution chart of where my money's come from. And clearly that's changed over time, and I expect it will change more in the future. When I started this out, I was mostly doing client work. That yellow band is direct client work. I supplemented that with work through consulting through agencies, um, mostly doing enterprise development stuff. I was working on developing products on the web when the App Store came around um, and kind of drew my attention. It took me a couple of years to get the ball rolling there to actually start get serious about it. <clears throat> but that's drawn my attention, and in the years, I've slowly phased out the agency work and most of the direct client work. And now this other category is mostly advertising income and is going to be a lot bigger this year and is a focus for me now in diversifying. What will, what will this look like in another 10 years? I really don't know. The next big thing may come along, and I may not even be in the app space anymore. Who knows? So our next set of opposing forces are flexibility and discipline. I almost titled this section Work and Life, but it didn't really capture the struggle. You know, flexibility is a reason people often cite for going indie, and it's a good reason. The job market has become more flexible. You know, remote work, flex time has become common. Um, but nothing can really compete with being your own boss. But gaining flexibility means giving up accountability. No one likes rigid schedules, performance reviews, and stuff, but these things exist for reasons. They've been developed over decades to maintain a disciplined workforce. Now, I'll admit that I am a bit of a slacker with squirrel chasing tendencies. I need systems in place to keep myself disciplined. Um, and it's something I've struggled with developing over the years. Let's look at some of the variables under your control. Your schedule. The biggest part of this is it's important to have a schedule, to know when you work. That sounds a little silly, but if you have complete flexibility, you may think you'll just decide to work when you want to, and that doesn't always work out so well. Maybe you're the type of person who's most creative and productive at one in the morning. More power to you. Um, you should work then. 
But for me, this has largely turned into being nine to five Monday through Friday. So I have that level of predictability. And when you know when you work, the corollary to that is you know when not to work. Um, if you get into projects that you're really excited about and passionate about, it's easy to just spend too much time on them um, and burn out. And you don't want to do that either. And when you're setting up your schedule, it's important to remember that planning is not an unscheduled activity. It's easy to sit down with your to-do list or task manager and lay out concrete tasks that you know need to be completed. Um, catching up on the support queue, fixing a bug, shipping a release, or whatever. And not leave time in that schedule to review your strategy and direction. And if you don't do that, a couple of bad things can happen. Um, one, you can work and work and work away for several months and suddenly you get your head above water and realize that all that work didn't get you any closer to your goals. The other thing that can happen is the planning seeps out into that time you're not supposed to be working. And it happens when you're laying in bed at night and you can't get to sleep because you're worrying about what your next move for your business is. Along the same lines, it's important to remember that creative work is not unscheduled. Um, if you're creating new products for yourself or for someone else, if you're exploring new technologies, if you're experimenting with things, you have to have that built into your schedule. Whether it takes the form of something like a free Friday or it's looser than that, it's got to be part of your work day or you're not going to make progress on these new things. You can also work with location to create discipline. And although it's self-evident, you have to have a place to work. Whether it's home, office, co-working spaces, libraries, coffee shops, there's lots of opportunities. But it's most important that you create separation, that there's a difference between where you work and where you don't work. Um, and maybe you're very self-motivated, but if you sit on the same couch to work that you sit on to binge watch Stranger Things, you're probably going to have some bleed over and you're going to have trouble keeping focus and discipline. And you can use your flexibility to create discipline. I do a lot of shifting context by task. I think people tend to underrate the value of sense of place. But if you repetitively do certain kinds of activities in certain kind of places, you associate them and it becomes a lot easier to focus. For, for me, I like to sit at my desk with my big monitor at home to write code. That big monitor is wonderful. But if I sit at my desk at my big monitor at home and try to do certain other kinds of things, I suddenly find myself back at Xcode. I don't even know how it happens. <laughs> but if I stop to do something like catch up on the support queue, it's time to take my laptop and go down to the coffee shop for a few hours. And if I do that repeatedly, I associate those places with what I'm supposed to be doing there. And it really helps me. You can do this in other simple ways too, like I got a sit stand desk, and I'm sure there's all sorts of wonderful health benefits to that, but I use it to context shift. And it may sound silly, yes, I'm in the same place, but if it's time to give myself a break to catch up on email and read some social media or whatever, I'll move to the standing position and it shifts context. And after 15 or 20 minutes when it's time to go back to work, I, I sit back down and I can focus again really easily. Oops. And again, use your flexibility to create variety. Don't burn out. Don't spend too much time working in one place. The corporate job environment kind of teaches you that when you're sitting at your desk at your computer, you're doing work, and when you're somewhere else, you're not. But it doesn't have to be that way. You also need to create accountability. If you don't have a boss hounding you for the TPS reports or, or whatnot, you have to somehow create accountability for yourself. Deadlines are... are the most common tool for this. And yes, you can set your own deadlines. The deadlines you set for yourself tend to be easy to slip. You can rely on deadlines that come from elsewhere. Clearly, if you're doing client work, 
Um, you have someone hounding you for stuff and your deadline's always yesterday. Um, you may have deadlines created for you from other sources. Say you're going to develop a new feature based on something Apple announces at DubDub in June, and you want it to be ready when the iOS ships in the fall. They've created a deadline for you, or a vague sense of when there'll be a deadline that they'll tell you about the first week of September. <laughs> um, you can also create external pressure. And the thing I do for this a lot is to tease products. We tend to think about teasing products as a marketing tool, but it's also a way of making a public promise that you're gonna deliver a certain feature or product in a reasonable time frame. So much like if you go on a diet, you're probably gonna tell some friends to help keep you honest. Um, it's a great tool for that. So our next set of opposing forces. Specialization and generalization. You know, conferences are great. You get together with a lot of specialists in your field. You know, if you want to know how the change in App Store review guideline or App Store review times affected markets, you came to the right place. You know, if you want to, if you want to know if a hurricane is going to hit the Pacific Northwest if Phil Schiller stubs his toe, you came to the right place. We, you know, collectively are experts in our field. And society likes experts. We get pushed from an early age to specialize. You're going to be an engineer or a doctor. And we spend a lot of time focusing on those things that make us special snowflakes. Um, but what if your specialty is not specializing? You know, we hear the idioms. They apply to small business people that you have to wear a lot of hats or you're a jack of all trades. And I'm here to say you should take joy and pride in being a generalist. Develop competency in a wide range of skills outside of your specialty. Um, and just to take an example, you know, there's a core amount of knowledge you need to run a business. It's in this blue area. There's all sorts of general things in there, accounting basics, marketing principles, all sorts of things that apply to any kind of business. To run a specific kind of business, you have a superset of that knowledge. It differs for different types of businesses, but they all share this core. But we tend to spend most of our time focusing on this green area, and that's where we're specializing. Those are the things very specific to our business. But if you spend time focusing on that blue area, you can unlock an incredible amount of value. Take the time to study other types of businesses in other industries, learn about successes and failures, and see how they'll apply to you. Because really you can learn to do anything if you apply the time to it. It's a matter of interest. All right, our next set of opposing forces are control and delegation. I don't have a whole lot to say on this. I, uh, I tried to have somebody else work on this section for me, but what they brought back, man, and I didn't have time to do it myself, so. But sarcasm aside, um, I think there's a bit of control freak in all of us, especially people who form their own businesses. And it can be difficult to let go of things and send them off to other people. So you need a certain amount of guidelines to help decide when to delegate something. And these are kind of the steps I walk through. I think you should delegate if you're unqualified to do the work. Now, the clear examples of this are accounting and legal. I mean, you could learn to do those things, but there's real consequences if they're done wrong, and the people who do them professionally have certifications and have spent years acquiring them. You should trust them to do their jobs. You should delegate if you're unprepared. Now, these are things you might be able to learn to do, but you don't currently have the expertise. You should delegate that if you're time constrained. You could choose to acquire that skill, and if acquiring that skill will benefit your business down the road, you should consider that. But a lot of times these are one-time needs. It's specific to a certain product launch or something, and you spending the time to gain that expertise is not gonna benefit your business down the road. So that's a good thing to delegate. You should delegate if you're disinterested. 
So these may be things you know how to do, but you don't really like to do. In fact, you don't like to do them so much it'll affect the quality of the work. And that's a good time to get someone else who's more interested in handling that task to do it. And lastly, you should delegate it if it's just not going to get done otherwise. Now these may be things you know how to do. These may be even things you enjoy doing, but you're just not going to get around to. Um, my best example of that in our space that I see happening all the time is documentation. Um, it's real easy to put off. And we still love to hold on to this concept that apps are supposed to be real intuitive and easy to use and shouldn't need a manual. And that was great in 2009 when you were making a tip calculator. But apps are now deep and complicated and they need documentation. And tangential to delegation, don't underrate the value of documentation as a marketing tool. I mean, it's not just something that helps your existing customers use your app better. It's something that helps potential customers evaluate your app. Right. The last set of opposing forces are modesty and vanity. I don't like to brag, and I'm, I'm pretty humble as a person, but you need a certain level of confidence and ego if you create things, if you put them out in the world. You need to believe in the value of your work. Um, but you need to not get too caught up in that. You need to be able to listen to valid feedback and not let your vanity about your products get in the way of your business. The best feedback loop is data. Data is a reality check for your vanity, especially your own data from your own business. You know, this is something I've let get in my way for too long in my business. I honestly believe I make things that have value and utility. I believe people should want to pay for them. The fact that I believe that really doesn't matter, though. Um, I get to choose a price for my work, but it doesn't mean I get to assign it a value. So to take an example from my own experiments with premium pricing, I mean, my biggest app is a productivity app called Draft. I it's been in the store since 2012, but two years ago, I relaunched it as a new SKU in the store at a App Store premium price of $9.99. Over the course of the last two years, I've put that app on sale a number of times for short periods of time, usually for 50% off, $4.99. So in the time that the app has been in the store, it's been on sale 7% of the time. But guess what? If you look back at the numbers, total units of drafts sold over the course of those two years, 65% of them have been sold at that 7% of the time it was on sale. And yes, I make more money when it's full price. Don't get technical on me. This would look a little more 50-50 if it was a revenue chart, but the writing is on the wall. People don't want to pay that for the app. Furthermore, I make other apps. I have free apps and advertising-based apps and things. And if I look at my total number of unit downloads over the course of the last year, 90% of them have been my free app. 10% have been paid up front app. Now, is there a way to make money in that 10% space? Sure, there probably is, especially if you address niches of different kinds. Um, but most of my apps are geared toward more or less mainstream audience. And I'm fighting upstream to try to convince people to pay for my apps where it's a whole lot less effort to meet them where they are in this 90%. And that's kind of where I'm working on refocusing now. So I've walked through a few examples, kind of going to wrap this up now, um, of the different kinds of opposing forces that I've struggled with. They're just examples. There are others, and the ones affecting you and your business may be different. But what I hope to get at is that as indies, you have the ability to reframe the problem, both the small battles and the big strategic shifts. Don't think of your business as a linear journey from point A to point B, from one goal to the next, or a series of revenue targets. Think about it, if you think about it as a quest for equilibrium, and you try to find the balance that's right for you that allows you to explore, create, and enjoy what you're doing. I think in the process, 
you will likely have maximized your shareholder value. And that's all I've got. Thanks for listening. <laughs>